I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar this morning um, on the subject of Excel Power Pivot. My name is Seth Bonder. I'll be the presenter. And um, I just want to start by mentioning a couple of little things in regard to the uh, webinar itself. Uh, first of all, um, I'd like to make sure that uh, I notify everyone, please, to enter any questions or comments in the chat or in the Q&A areas. I'll be checking periodically and answering them from there. Um, the webinar will not be locked. Anybody can uh, come and go anytime they want, but uh, I want to try and move along smoothly here. So again, if anybody has any questions, uh, either the chat area or the Q&A area will be the place for those. And since, as I say, I will check them periodically and answer the questions as I can, uh, we'll go from there. As far as the content is concerned, uh, we'll be doing four main things here. First, I want to do a little bit of an intro and talk about what exactly Power Pivot is and what it's for. Uh, some people have heard of it, and a few people have even seen it doing its thing, but I want to try and get a little bit of depth and explain why it exists, because it's not just there for the heck of it. The second thing we're going to talk about is building the data model. When Power Pivot is installed and turned on, it allows us to pull data from a fairly large number of different sources in order to make use of that information within Excel. And building the data model is the term that is normally used to describe getting the data together, coordinating the different sources, connecting them, creating what are known as relationships among the data tables, and then making use of them. The main place we make use of those data tables, those data sources, is in creating pivot tables and pivot charts, hence the name of the feature, Power Pivot. And um, once we bring the data in, once we make the connections, the actual use of the data is pretty straightforward. If anybody has ever created a pivot table or pivot chart, if you know how to do the basics on that, you know, create a batch of data and otherwise bring in information, um, setting up pivot tables and pivot charts once that's done, is very easy. We're also going to talk about using something called data analysis expressions or DAX. Again, this is intended to be broadly similar to the way things work in Excel itself when we create formulas using functions like sum or average or max. What we want to look at here, um, in addition to uh, creating the pivot tables and pivot charts, is using what is referred to as uh, data analysis expressions, which allows us to write formulas with our uh, electronically hooked up data sources in much the same way as we can write formulas in, uh, in Excel. Um, let me just check one thing here before we go on, if I may. Bear with me for one second, please. All right. <clears throat> to continue, um, I wanted to uh, just reiterate very briefly if a couple of people uh, just came in and or uh, uh, were accidentally uh, uh, unhooked from the webinar, um, please go ahead and use the chat area and the uh, Q&A area, and I will try to uh, check them periodically and answer them. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of Power Pivot, we first have to talk about a couple of differences between Excel itself and Power Pivot, as well as how to turn the feature on in the program. Let me go ahead and tuck these slides away for the moment. Um, first off, before we do anything at all, we need to enable Power Pivot. And this is not hard at all. It is installed as part of the program, but it is um, deactivated. It's uh, rather like the way a lot of cars now have satellite radio capability, uh, the XM type radio, but it is not automatically activated. One has to get the subscription in for it. Well, turning on Power Pivot in Excel is very straightforward. We simply start by going to the File tab and finding the options for the program down near the bottom here. We can then go to the next to last category, which would be the add-ins. And we can see that there's a list of the active and the inactive application add-ins. And Power Pivot is indeed mentioned right here in the list. 
since it is what they call a COM add-in as opposed to a conventional Excel add-in, what we need to do is go down to the manage control here, give the drop down a click and specify the COM add-ins and then click go. When we bring up the list of COM add-ins, we see the power pivot is indeed among them. Simply check the check mark, click OK, and after a couple more seconds, the Power Pivot tab appears in the ribbon. This allows us to use it just as if it was always a part of the program. And you can leave the check mark checked. Power Pivot will stay on. It'll stay visible at all times. You can use it whenever you need to. The main reason it isn't automatically activated on startup is because it does take up a little extra processing power, a little extra memory. And if you're going to use it, obviously you can leave it on. If not, no need to take up the extra capacity. Once that's done, once it's enabled, we could take a look at what it does. The most important thing, if we're going to use Power Pivot at all, if we're going to bring in uh, additional data, is the button here for managing Power Pivot, which allows us to go to the Power Pivot window, which we will do, of course, in a few minutes. We can also create a couple of additional things within the window, measures, key performance indicators, and we can add items to the data model. We can also detect relationships between the tables used in the pivot table, and this way we can sometimes do better data correlation, as well as making a few of the settings do what we need them to do. I do want to talk about one other thing before I actually get into the nuts and bolts, and that is this um, table here on my next slide. Because one of the things that people ask about is what we can do in Excel versus Power Pivot. And Power Pivot is actually used to combine data from various sources into one essentially database, but as part of an Excel 2016 workbook. We can integrate data from multiple sources. We can manipulate data sets that are larger than Excel could normally handle without any trouble. That's the main thing. Some people want to work with data sources that are significantly bigger than Excel knows what to do with. Some people need to work with database-ish data sources, things like access databases, SQL databases, um, other kinds of data tables which may or may not always be importable into Excel. So Power Pivot lets us connect those into Excel and then allows us to use them primarily for creating pivot tables, pivot charts, and adding on a few things to those, which again, normally Excel can't do. If you take a quick look at this list of uh, differences and similarities between Excel and Power Pivot, we can see that it can do some things which uh, uh, Excel can do, but maybe in a different form, importing data from different sources, uh, creating tables, editing data in a table. Well, we can do that in Excel, but not in Power Pivot, which is kind of a mixed blessing. It has its good and bad points. Creating relationships between tables is not too hard either. But there are at least two things that we can do in Power Pivot that we can't in Excel. One of them is create what are called hierarchies. This allows us to arrange um, data sets such that we could start with, let's say, data for the year, and then do what's called a drill down and look at data for the quarter maybe then for the month, maybe possibly even for the day, if that information is available in the data source to begin with. We can also create what are called key performance indicators uh, in Power Pivot, which can be used in pivot tables in Excel, but which cannot be directly created in Excel. So it adds on a couple of things that Excel simply can't do or could only do in a very limited fashion. Therefore, we see now that Power Pivot as an add-on does provide us some good capabilities. There are a couple of other things which we may not end up using a great deal. And if you're not going to be working with especially large data sets, then there's no need to worry about using Power Pivot uh, the majority of the time. But you can always turn it on later if you find out differently. Let me go ahead and minimize my slides here. And we'll talk about how to actually build the data model, which is the fundamental thing we have to do. The data model is simply the term for 
the collection of data sources which we can get to through Power Pivot and use within Excel. Power Pivot provides kind of a conduit or a link up between them. First thing I have to do, having activated Power Pivot, is to go ahead and manage so I can bring up the Power Pivot window. This is one of the things that some people occasionally find a little confusing when they first start using uh, Power Pivot is because it works, or at least does most of its thing in a separate window, some people think that Power Pivot is a separate program and that it could be used independently of Excel. This is not the case. Power Pivot is part of Excel. The reason we set up a separate window, as you'll see here in a moment, is because Power Pivot handles so much data and needs a place to do it where we can, so to speak, focus on it without being distracted by Excel, that we have to have a separate window. Once the window is open, we can see that it does indeed say Power Pivot for Excel, so we know which window we're in at all times. And when we want to start gathering data, we usually go to the Home tab, and we can see here right off the bat that there's a Get External Data group in the ribbon. To start gathering the data, we can click in the drop-down, for example, from database here, and tell the program if we wanted to use an access database, and click on it here. We would then need to do the usual navigation, browsing, specify a few things, and we can even change the connection name. We can add on the name of the database, which in this case happens to be called Contoso Sales, hypothetical company. We then have to browse to where the data can be found. So we click on Browse. From here, it's pretty vanilla. We just have to navigate to wherever the file is located. Here we indeed have the Contoso Sales database, which we can see is pretty hefty. It's 136 megs, which means that it's going to be at least a little bigger than Excel is used to handling. You simply double click it, and that creates the critical part of the connection. Uh, somebody's asking, could you connect to an Oracle database from the external data button? Well, from the group, yes, you could actually. I'll show you how we can do that in just a moment. The next thing is to test the connection. And this is not absolutely required, but it's considered good practice to make sure that Excel and Power Pivot really can see the connection to the data. Usually it'll succeed if you can do what we just did here at all. Then we click Next. And now what we have to do is tell the program, essentially, where are we getting our data? So we can say select from a list of tables, or we can even write a query that will specify the data to import. I'll just go with selecting from the list of tables. Now we can see that we could check to select any or all of them. In fact, if I go up here to the top of the list of tables and views, I can even click this first check mark, which says I want to bring in all the tables at the same time. If we wanted to be pickier, obviously check whichever ones. And since that's all I need to do here, I can just click Finish. And it usually takes a moment to do this, especially with a large table like the one here called Fact Sales, which, as we can see, is going to incorporate over a million rows. That's one of the biggest tables in the database, and therefore is going to take the longest. I can tell you from personal experience, I've seen uh, imports even bigger than this. It'll take several minutes sometimes but normally doesn't give any trouble. Since we now have succeeded in importing our data, we can click Close at the bottom of the box. And then what happens is that in the Power Pivot window, we get the list of tables, rather like the uh, worksheet tabs in an Excel workbook. We can click on the different tabs down here one at a time. And as we click, we can see the number of records sitting down here in the status bar. The biggest one, as we saw, was fact sales. You see that's 1,017,000 odd rows. Now, the gentleman asked, can we connect to an Oracle database? The answer is yes. We would simply have to do it from other sources up here. If I click on from other sources, we can see that Oracle is indeed listed uh, among the total collection that Power Pivot can get to. 
Um, I've even seen a couple of others listed occasionally. Apparently there are a couple of additional add-ons that are available, but this is the main list. And again, if we click from other sources, that's how we would get there. Anything that corresponds to any of these kinds of databases, SQL Server, SQL Azure, Microsoft Access, Oracle, Teradata, Sybase, uh, IBM DB2, multi-dimensional sources, and even things as simple as text files and Excel files are available if we want them. Having brought in the data from our Access database, what I want to do next is even talk about something, I guess you'd say very simplistic, uh, because it is important to understand that uh, Power Pivot is fairly flexible on how we bring in data. And um, what I'm going to do here is minimize both Power Pivot and Excel for a second. I'm going to go into my Power Pivot files here, and I want to bring up an Excel file. Uh, namely, the one here called DIM Product Category. It takes a second or two to do its thing regardless. And once I've got it open, I can actually just go ahead and select the data. Of course, this presumes that it's laid out more or less in the fashion that we'd be uh, interested in. Uh, we want to have labels in the first row. We want to have the columns be you know, consistently laid out. But I can actually now just go ahead and copy just plain old ordinary copy. I can um, close this file, just a file to close in the normal fashion. Don't have to worry about saving or anything. I can now go back into Power Pivot. And what I want to do now is um, tell it I want to paste. I actually do have to click somewhere up here in the data in any of the tables. I don't know if you noticed, but the uh, Paste button was uh, grayed out there for a second. Okay, hold on one second here. Let's see. Okay. Open our DIM product category. Select the data. Copy. Close the file. Back into our pivot. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. For some reason or other, it's uh, not allowing me to do the paste, but I've seen it actually misbehave like this once or twice. It seems to be some quirk of the program or something. But uh, once we've actually copied, um, let's see. Okay, let me just go ahead and see if we can save the file and it'll allow me to do that then. Um, okay, just make sure we save to the right location. And by the way, as a side note, even though we're not seeing anything going on just yet in the main Excel window, there will be information in here when we finish if we create uh, pivot tables or pivot charts. And the information in Power Pivot itself is actually stored uh, within the Excel file. Okay, for some reason or other, it's uh, not allowing me to uh, uh, do the paste thing here. All right, in any event, I did want to mention that under normal conditions, at least, we should be able to paste our uh, data in and it will create another table. Now, once we've started bringing tables in, once we've started bringing in our alternate chunks of data, one other thing that we sometimes want to do is check what is known as the diagram view. And you can see over here, coming away from the home tab over to the view group, if I click on diagram view, what we should see come up after a couple of seconds is the tables which we've imported in through Power Pivot. We also see that the program has taken, I guess you'd say an educated guess, on which tables should be connected to which via which fields. If we were to give a double click on one of the connector lines here, we can even see which field from which table is connecting which field in which other table. 
We don't have to make any changes in most cases, but it helps to be able to double check that we're connecting between the right pair of fields. In the real world, it's considered good practice to make sure that if you're going to do what we're doing here, that the tables should have the appropriate field names set up, the appropriate data types, if necessary, that the field lengths should match. This way, when we bring the data into Power Pivot, there should be no trouble with making the connections. Otherwise, it's like two railroad cars that are set up for different gauges of rail. Uh, they can't couple together because the couplers may not be at the right height or at the right position. So making sure that the data are set up in advance, if possible, is highly advisable. If we go back to data view, okay, we can import from other sources as well. If I actually wanted to import from the Excel file, I can click on from other sources. If doing the direct copy and paste starts acting quirky, I can just uh, import directly, as we see here, using the Excel file choice. It's treated as a text file. I click Next. Again, I can browse. Again, I can navigate. And I can see here's my DIM product category. Double click it. And the friendly connection name can be updated manually if it doesn't update as you see here. Test the connection if we want. Click Next. And then the only problem we would have is making sure of which sheet was being brought in. We may have to change the sheet name in advance or something like that. But once that's done, we can click Finish. And it got the data. Click on Close. It takes a few more seconds to do its thing. And here we do indeed have our information. Again, I'm just sort of cheating here a little so you can see the technique. Uh, I might have to do a little bit more prep to do what I just did here instead of doing a straight copy and paste. However, the information can be brought in. If I wanted to use a text file, literally a just plain old ordinary text file, I can do that as well. Click on from other sources once more. Scroll down, plain old text file right here at the bottom. Click on Next. And again, Browse. We have a file here called Stores, which just happens to have been laid out in the correct fashion. Double click. When we do this, though, we get a choice of what kind of separator or delimiter, as the correct term is, um, to indicate where a piece of information stops or starts. And this rather squished looking appearance here is because the column separator or delimiter is incorrect. The most common delimiter in many text files is the tab. So if we click on tab, give it a few seconds to update, we will see that the appearance of the data should come up a lot more normal. Again, sometimes it takes a moment, depends on the amount of information in the file. There we go. And although I um, might make the box a little wider, I can also scroll here if I want. The key point is that I can see the information now looks quote unquote normal. We see rows and columns each thing separated from the next by vertical lines because the program saw that the tab delimiter worked correctly. We can now scroll down and see all of our rows of data. Once we've got this arrangement, I can even chop out the word text if I want, change the friendly connection name. When I'm done, click finish. Again, sometimes takes a moment. total of 306 rows. And um, once the uh, box gets out of our way, once the import is completed, come on. Okay, there we go. We can see that the name of the connection appears in the tab here. And it turns out we have, as it says, 306 rows. We can scroll through and take a look.
So now we can see that it's possible to bring in at least a number of different kinds of data. Um, if I want to bring in an Excel file, which has been set up for us, quote unquote, correctly in advance, the geography file here is the one I'd like to use for that. Again, change the friendly connection name if I want, test the connection. And if I know that there are labels at the top there, I can tell it to use the first row as column headers. Check the check mark, click next, check the name of the sheet that I want to bring in, click on finish. Again, goes through the process. I just wanted to mention, because people have asked me many times, uh, how long does it take to bring in data? Um, it can depend. But don't panic if it takes a few minutes, even for a fairly small block of data to be imported. When that's done, close the box. Again, I've seen the table import wizard box hover for a minute before it goes away. Um, seems to be just a quirk of the program, and here we are. So now we have all the tables, data sources that we might want. Again, we can go to diagram view and take a look at what's available. Sometimes we have a table sitting off to one side which for whatever reason was not connected to its buddies because the program may not have known how to do so. In fact, here as I scroll over to the right, I can even see that the stores table and the geography table uh, were not connected either. I can make those connections if I need to. I can tell the program that I want to uh, hook up, let's say between um, the stores table and the geography table. And all I have to do is make sure I know which field I want to connect. As I see here, there's a field called geography key. I can literally just drag the one right onto the other. Just have to watch where you aim the white arrow. And let go. Again, takes a few seconds to make the connection. If you want to be absolutely certain, you can double click the connector line. And make sure that the two matching fields did their hookup. Then later, if I want to do any other hookups between any of the other tables, I can certainly do so. Again, half the problem with making these uh, connections that the program didn't know how to make was just knowing which field name to use between which pair of tables. And there are cases where you might have more than one field which could be used. Um, then you may have to check with the database administrator or whoever else is in charge of the data sources to make sure of which pair of fields you should be using. Uh, sometimes if there's more than one, you may need to determine uh, which field should have the relationship hookup for the purposes of creating your pivot tables or whatever else. Once we've got all of these hooked up in whatever fashion, uh, it is usually a good idea to save because as I mentioned earlier, even if we are bringing the data sources in through Power Pivot, the connections and the use of the data are being stored in the Excel workbook. If you want to, you can actually go to the uh, uh, quick access toolbar up here, find the button to jump back into Excel itself, and you can hit the save button in the Excel window. It may seem a little, you know, overcautious in some ways, but uh, certainly it never hurts to save. All right. To continue, we now want to see how to create pivot tables and pivot charts using this information. We can sometimes sit down and sort of ask ourselves, do we need the chart, the table, or both? Uh, the fact of the matter is, we can do both. Normally, in Excel, if you want to create a pivot table, you simply have to have a batch of data from which to create it. If you want to create a pivot chart, the usual rule in Excel is that we have to have created a pivot table first. Or, if we try to create the pivot chart, the pivot table will be created along with it, because the normal procedure is that if you want to chart something, you have to have some data to chart. If you want to create a pivot chart, therefore you have to have a pivot table on which to base it. However, when we use Power Pivot, 
it is possible to create a pivot chart independent of a pivot table. It's not something we would do every day, but the program will allow it under these circumstances. So if we now want to create a pivot table using the data from Power Pivot, we can first jump back into the Power Pivot window and go back to Data View, just so we can see our tables. Then what we would do is go over to the um, Pivot Table dropdown here, which is sort of in a group by itself. We can click the dropdown and we see that we have something like six or seven choices in which we can uh, decide what we want to do. We can create just a straight pivot table, straight pivot chart, do a chart and table in horizontal or a vertical orientation, pair of charts, horizontal or vertical. We can even do four charts at once and have each of them hook up to a separate batch of data within Power Pivot or have them all do variations of the same thing. We'll just start with a plain ordinary pivot table here for demonstration. Notice if you will, that as soon as I told it I wanted to create a pivot table in the Power Pivot window, we were jumped back into the regular Excel window. And the program is asking me if I want to put my pivot table on a new worksheet or the existing worksheet. I can go either way. I'll just go with existing worksheet. When I click OK, as you can now see, if you've ever worked with pivot tables or pivot charts in Excel, from here on, not to sound flippant, but it's pretty vanilla because now we've got a place to put our pivot table. And as is the usual, we have our pivot table field list showing up over here on the right. All we would have to do is find which table we want to get our data from, um, let's say our fact sales table, scroll down, find the table, click the little twister arrow here to expand it, and then scroll through the fields available in the fact sales table. I'll uh, go ahead and use sales amount. They're normally listed in the order that they were sitting in the original data source. So I turn on sales amount, and okay, right now we just get the sum of sales amount because as a quantity, the program tossed that into the value space. But if I now continue in the normal fashion, I can add fields, but I can add fields from any of the other tables. And this is the real key to the strength of Power Pivot. If in the Power Pivot window, I've created relationships among the tables, they quote unquote understand that when I do what I'm doing here, I want the sales amount in the fact sales table to relate to, um, let's say the dim date table. You can go there and find dim date, open that up. And let's say I want to do calendar year. Now years being numbers, the program might try to throw the years into the value space if I simply click the check mark. So if I drag the calendar year field into columns, force the program to understand that I mean them as labels, the years will do what they're supposed to do. We have them divide up the sales amounts by year and still show the grand total. Then if I want to grab something from yet another table, I can collapse the dim date table. I can uh, go ahead and find the dim product subcategory and uh, open that up. And I can find the product subcategory name. Again, I can drag it where I want it if I choose to plop it in the row space, for example. There we go. Now we've got ourselves a pretty normal looking pivot table. Obviously, I could go a good deal further than this. If I wanted to, I could add pretty much any field from any other of the tables I want. But the key point here is that because all the tables, which I brought into Power Pivot, or most of them, were told how to relate to each other, in some cases the program was able to guess, in other cases I would have to manually make the connections, I can treat all of those tables and all of the fields within them as one big mass of data. And it means that I can find out things about the data in all those tables, treating them, I don't want to say so much as a unit, maybe as treat them as a team, 
So not only can I manage larger individual blocks of data than I could in Excel, because as you may be aware, Excel is limited to about a million rows per sheet and about 16,000 columns. Not that we have any blocks of data with that many columns, but if I need to pull data from an access database whose size limitation is something like two gigabytes, already pretty hefty, or if, as the one gentleman asked, um, if I wanted to pull a block of information from an Oracle database, uh, whose size I think goes well beyond that, I can do so. And I can use all of that data, once I bring it in through Power Pivot, exactly as I would smaller blocks of data from Excel worksheets. So that's the real power here, that we can coordinate, correlate, whatever term you want to use, blocks of data much bigger than we convention than we would otherwise be able to conventionally do. If I want to do a pivot chart, um, same principle. I can even do it directly from my pivot table here, or if I want, I can just go right back to uh, uh, Power Pivot itself and uh, click the drop down for the choice there. Go to pivot chart. Again, we immediately jump back into the Excel window. I'll use a new worksheet this time just for demonstration. And here we are again, same exact idea, same exact concept. All I have to do now is the same thing I was doing earlier. Um, choose which tables, which fields from which tables, scroll down here and uh, find, uh, again, my fact sales, just for simplicity so you can see the operation. Um, in my fact sales table, again, I can scroll down, find uh, sales amount, Check the check mark. Then uh, collapse the fact sales. Find the table called dim date. Open that up. Again, calendar year. Drag that to uh, the legend, which would be the equivalent of our columns. And go to dim product. Open that up. And grab a hold of brand name and drag that down to the axis. And here we are. <clears throat> One piece of sort of good news about working with pivot charts, pivot tables, they have the same strengths and limitations as they would if we were getting the data from a conventional Excel source. The main limitation <clears throat> that I always like to mention when I talk about pivot charts is something which some people have called data density. Um, I'm not sure if there's a better term for it, but basically it relates to the idea that you want to make sure you don't put too many things in a pivot chart. Because unlike a pivot table, a pivot chart is a little more limited in room. You can grab one of the sizing handles and drag to make the chart bigger, but there's a limit to how big we can have the chart be physically, width and height, and still be of any use, let's say, in printing out or PDFing or wherever else, maybe in a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. So a pivot table, if you keep adding fields to it, regardless of which table you're bringing them in from, it can just take up more and more of the space on the worksheet. A pivot chart, we have to be a little more picky on because if I were to add more than two or three more fields here, if for example, I were to check the check mark for manufacturer and then I were to check the one for product name, we can see that the pivot chart very quickly kind of overloads. There'd be no way to really make this chart usable. So I would uncheck product name and manufacturer. But again, just the same as if I was working with a conventional data source from within Excel. It's sort of good in a way because it means that we know what we're doing here. Once we make the connection to the data, we're ready to go. Everything else is very straightforward. The last thing that I want to talk about here, I'm going to go back into our Power Pivot window for. I want to talk for a few minutes about this thing called DAX, or Data Analysis Expressions. And um, when we start talking about DAX, one of the things people ask is, how different is it from using the various functions in Excel, sum, average, max, min, count? And the answer is not very. 
There is a complete glossary of the DAX expressions, et cetera, uh, available within the program and on the Microsoft website. Um, any one of the several books on the subject will give you a complete list. But the two main things that I want to just mention here, first off, if I wanted to add a, uh, oh, okay, just uh, wanted to make sure, okay. Sorry, I thought somebody was uh, jumping in with another question there. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, a couple of people had asked questions in the chat area. I apologize. Uh, is there anything particular needed to connect to a SQL database and tables? Well, the basic answer is uh, the same way as we did before here. Um, we can just connect directly uh, using the same basic process as we did for the sources that I mentioned here. As far as removing um, tables from the data model, as you can see here, I can simply right click on a tab and say delete. We can see that it's then very easy to permanently delete the table, including any associated measures. Uh, if we remove a table by accident, we can always put it back in. So that's the answer to that one. Beg your pardon. Okay. If I want to set up what is called a calculated column, I would find whichever table I wanted to add that to. Uh, I'll use dim product here. And in order to add a column that calculates something for each row, I would have to scroll over all the way to the right. As we can see here, there's a space called add column. Oh, okay, uh, someone's asking how to remove many tables. Must I click each tab? I apologize. Um, as far as I know, uh, one has to do them on a one at a time basis. Um, I've not seen a way to select a group of them because clicking and then shift clicking, as you can see here, still only allows me to select one at a time. Um, if you happen to find a way, um, please let me know through our company website. I'll be happy to hear about it. Okay. Going back to the uh, dim product table, as I said, I'm gonna scroll all the way over to the right here and uh, click in the space for add column. Now, when I do this, I can see that a formula bar of sorts has emerged up here just above my table. I can then actually click in there <clears throat> and I can tell the program that I want to ask about um, information pertaining to other columns in the table. If I want to do um, a straight formula, however, um, I could do that also in any column. Um, I could specify a formula for, let's say, uh, uh, net profit or something like that here. In fact, let me go ahead and do one of those first. I'm going to fact sales. Let me hit the escape there. Go to fact sales. Again, scroll all the way over to the right. Oh, and uh, somebody's asking about uh, control clicking to select multiple sheets. All right, let's give that a quick try here. Uh, again, I'm afraid not. As we can see, once again, the program only allows us to do uh, one at a time. Okay. So I click over here in our uh, empty column. I can go up to our formula bar. And what I want to do is create a formula rather similar to one we might run into in Excel. I can type the equals. The program will then understand if I want to use a square bracket to indicate a field name. The example here might be, as I said, something like calculating profit. And if I type the open square bracket, I could then find, for example, the sales amount field here, double click, from the total sales amount, I could subtract um, total cost, let's say. Again, type the open bracket, find total cost, and then subtract from that um, the return amount, which we can see the field right there. Again, typing the open bracket gives the program a hint, and here we are. 
once we've completed the formula, the principle is the same as what we've run into in Excel. We can click the check mark. It takes a few seconds to do its thing as usual. And here we have the calculated total. Now, calling the column calculated column one may sound a little silly. So if I right click on it, I can tell it I want to rename and then call it profit or whatever other name would happen to suit. Sometimes again, it takes a few seconds to update. I've seen that hesitation or pause uh, in almost every, on, on almost every computer I've ever worked with. So I don't think it has anything to do with the speed of the processor or anything like that per se. Uh, if anybody finds out different, I'll be very interested in hearing about it. One last point, which I want to touch on, um, what they call calculated fields. What we just did in creating a calculated column says we want to perform the same calculation for each row, whether it's 10 rows or 100 rows or a million rows. If I want to do something, so to speak, in the vertical direction, if I want to find out about something pertaining to a column, uh, total cost, sales amount, or any other set of quantities, let's say an average, I need to go down to this open space below the main table. You may have noticed that when I've been scrolling up and down a bit, there's a piece of space which looks like it belongs to the table, but it's actually empty and it could be scrolled on its own. Down here is where we define what they call measures, also known as calculated fields. If I wanted to do, let's say an average total cost, I could go down to the uh, calculated space there. Um, and there's actually a calculations group. I can click the drop down for auto sum and tell it I want to see the average. And after a couple seconds, that's exactly what I get. I have to widen out the column to uh, uh, see the number. I can actually put the cursor on the divider here between the two columns, just as I would in Excel. And I have to drag out a little further the average total cost for all the items in this million plus row table is $1,762 and change. If I wanted to know the sum of the sales amounts or the sum of the profits, I can do that too. I'm just clicking the appropriate uh, space down here in our uh, calculated field area. Click the drop down again. Tell it I want to know the sum. Oh, another operation is in progress. Okay. Okay, it's being weird. All right, now I can do it over here. Click in the space, click the drop down, click on sum. Again, may have to widen the column. This time, probably pretty wide because that's a lot of sales. So I drag out, and we see that it actually matches the number which came up in our pivot table a little while back. All of this gives us. I guess you would say a few additional channels or a few additional ways to ask questions of our data, which is really what pivot tables and pivot charts are about. Now, if we wanted to use any of these in the pivot table, that's the real kicker. If I jump back over into our regular Excel window and take a look either at the pivot table or the pivot chart, I could now find the table in question and open it up and I would see that in the list of fields for that table, the FX symbol is telling me I've got calculated fields here. I've created additional de facto fields that I could incorporate into my pivot table or my pivot chart. So the individual features may seem like just a little here, a little there, dribs and drabs, whatever term you want to use. But Power Pivot adds up to a fairly potent tool. If you take all the pieces you know, as a team, it gives us the ability to do some things which either would require a lot more hoop jumping in Excel by itself, or which couldn't be done at all. And these aren't, uh, these are not the whole, the whole group. This isn't the whole list. There are a couple of other things that we talk about in our Power Pivot class. I'll uh, just mention briefly 
uh, as we're going to finish up here now, that the next uh, offerings for the class this year, 2019, will be on September 27th, on October 25th, and November 22nd. If you uh, want to take a look at registering for those, you can go to uh, skillforge.com slash courses. If you have any more general questions, you can go ahead and let us know through uh, info at skillforge.com. Oh, okay. And one other person asked a question here. I want to make sure that when I make changes to any of the data in the tables that I added to the data model, uh, those changes do not affect the original data source. Uh, the, one other question, a uh, person was late for the session. Will the webinar be available online later? Yes, sir, it will. Uh, you'll want to check with the office as to the exact availability, but it will be. Uh, as for this one final question, uh, we make changes to any of the data in the tables that are added to the data model. Let me say um, that once the data are brought in in the data model, the data cannot be edited in Power Pivot. So um, it's sort of good news. Uh, you can't affect the data in the data model in Power Pivot. If you wanted to make changes to the data, you would need to go back to the source itself and then refresh within Power Pivot. So you can't accidentally mess up your data at the Power Pivot end. And I'm, I apologize for not mentioning that sooner, uh, but I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Um, many people have asked that sort of question. Can we accidentally you know, or deliberately make any changes at the power pivot end? The answer is no, we cannot. You can make changes at the source. Um, column names, not to the best of my knowledge. Here, let's uh, just double check real quick before we finish up. If I right click here, oh, okay, you can rename the column, but you cannot change the data within it. So column names, yes. Actual data, no. Good point to bring up, thank you. All right, um, any other questions, comments, anything else at all? All right, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And um, as the one question was posed, yes, the webinar will be available online later. If you have any other questions about the class or any other questions pertaining to any of this sort of thing, um, by all means, take a look at the class if you want to. And uh, I'll certainly be willing to answer questions during class. Um, I do teach it. So I'll look forward to seeing you if circumstances allow. And I uh, wish everybody a, a good day and a good weekend. Thanks again for coming in.